What's up, everybody? We have a special guest today. Jeff Sal Skalski? Is that how you say this? Skalski. Like a skull that skis. So ah, Skalski. There that's we the go. Yeah. You know, Michael knows how bad I am at last names. And it just mm. becomes a meme on the show at ITG here now at this point. That's how it rolls here. But Jeff, dude, thank you so much for joining us. You're from Yellow Brick Games, and we're here to talk about Eternal Strands. Excellent. Before we get there, though... This isn't your first rodeo, man. You've been around for a little uh, bit now. Yeah, a little gray in the beard. <laughs> I lost all my what? hair. Uh, Why don't you get yeah. some history on yourself? Because you got some pretty cool games, dude. I, I've, I've played a lot of them. Oh, awesome. Well, thanks, Drew. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, been around, been around a little while. It's going on 28 years for me uh, in this, in this industry. Um, I started back at, in an old school, uh, PC uh, company called Microprose, mm -hmm. uh, Civ two, uh, test of time, <laughs> magic, the gathering, like, so that's how far back I'm going back into the late nineties for myself. Um, spun out of there, did a, my first attempt at doing a startup went horribly wrong, but I learned so much when I was 20. Um, but then I landed at an awesome company called mythic entertainment. Uh, which some of you may know what that what that company was. We did Dark Age of Camelot uh, was the, one of the big uh, claims to fame for us there, and later went off to do like Warhammer Online, and we took over Ultima Online, and eventually we were acquired by EA. And I worked at Electronic Arts for quite some time, uh, and then eventually made the switch to Ubisoft, uh, which I had the awesome pleasure to work for that amazing company with a lot of amazing people on the Assassin's Creed franchise and a couple other franchises. Uh, so, uh, but been back in 2020 during like the height of the pandemic, um, decided to do my own leap of faith in a different direction and, uh, started off, uh, yellow brick games with a couple other, uh, three other co-founders. And, uh, here we are today, uh, you know, four years later and, uh, 70 people almost. And, wow. uh, it's pretty incredible working on this dream game of ours. Uh, in a crazy climate that our industry is currently in. So <laughs> we're happy to have this opportunity and doing everything we can to uh, get this game out the door as now we're self-publishing it. So yeah, lots of stuff we can unpack over this call. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. Absolutely. It's a pleasure is all ours. Let's get into the fact that you started up Yellow Break Games. What's that process like when you take a look at the industry where we are today? Dude, we've had some a couple rough years to say the least, right? Bunch of layoffs, the latest coming out with Concord, all of a sudden getting shut down two weeks after. Like, is that a concern to you as a, just a, I would still say an early company? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, absolutely. It's been horrific seeing what's been going on. You know, uh, you know, I'll have a lot of friends and close friends and colleagues who have had ups and downs with, you know, either being laid off or having to shut their studio down. Huh. I, I mean, so, so much stuff going on. It's really horrible to see that happen. Um, especially, you know, when you love this industry so much um, as a developer, but also as a consumer, I, I play these games. I'm excited, you know, to play everything that's coming out. Uh, just last night, I finally fired up Star Wars Outlaws. And, you know, <laughs> over the last holiday weekend, I put 30 hours into Final Fantasy 11, like oh, back in time hey. with my son. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah. we're going to learn how to get a Dragoon. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, it's, I'm, I'm always playing and consuming everything. So, um, but yeah, when you see, and, uh, you know, sadly, the ugly side of, of what's been going on, it's been really tough, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm sure you've heard the narrative over and over again, but, you know, our industry did great during the pandemic. Yeah, um, people were at home; they needed to do something. Um, they weren't traveling, so it's like, cool, great. I can so many great, high quality, free to play games out there. So many premium, high quality games out there. I mean, everyone was just consuming everything. Everyone's really happy, yeah. and money was flowing. And then, uh, but you knew we knew that bubble was going to bust. It wasn't going to hold. I mean, eventually, the pandemic is going to settle. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of people bet a little bit too big, um, and now we're seeing the kind of the pendulum swing back the other way, sadly. Um, and there's other challenges uh, going on too. It's not just because of the pandemic. I think there's there's lots of things going on, uh, you know, from the cost it's taking to build these games. Who are we building these games for at the end of the day? Um, you know, it, it's really tough and no one has a crystal ball to know what the next big hit is going to be. Uh, whether it's indie, whether it's AAA, it's, it's, it's all over the place. So, um, but I think at the end of the day, at least our industry is still putting up some really healthy numbers in terms of its growth over the long term. Um, but we're still trying to figure out uh, there's a lot more games in development. Everyone's fighting for the attention. There's a lots of great games out there that sadly just don't get heard about. So um, it's tough. We're still we're still learning. 
Yeah, it's, it's funny. We're still an early company, right? Or in yeah. early industry, and we're still everybody's still learning how to make this all function at the end of the day. But then the big leap for you, yeah, your own studio. How does that feel? Awesome, horrifying, and amazing <laughs> all at the same time. Uh, keeping everything transparent and open. Yeah. Uh, but I love it. I absolutely love it because it's like we can. You know, get up in the morning, I could be grabbing a coffee, having a conversation with someone, and then we can test something by lunch. We can make the call whether we go forward with it or not by the end of the day. Right. And it's so much quicker. I used to always wonder, because I've, I've always been part of bigger companies like Electronic Arts, Ubisoft. Mm. These, are, these are gigantic, and again, incredible companies. Um, but it's a very different reality when you're in that situation with that amount of budget and resources then you're in a smaller company. I always used to look as a developer looking at these amazing indie games coming out, you know, companies like super giant, like they just crush it every time. Uh, and I'm just going, man, how can they produce what they're producing with such a small amount of team? And it's just because they can move so fast. They can make decisions so quick. So one person is almost like 10 people. Um, and so it's been uh, really, I underestimated that coming into uh, Yellow Brick Games. Um, and I've been able to see what our team has been able to do and produce. And I'm hoping players feel that in the pad or on the keyboard and mouse when they play Eternal Strands early next year. Um, because we've been, yeah, sure, we've been pouring our hearts and souls into it, but we've also been able to make a lot of decisions and focus on what we thought were our strengths and don't spend time on things that didn't have, you know, what we thought would be the biggest ROI and hopefully giving something players will be excited uh, to play and, and talk about. Well, you mentioned it, your game, Eternal Strands. Tell us all about it. Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, Eternal Strands. I mean, we just announced it uh, April earlier uh, this year. Um, again, we've been in development on this thing since 2020. Uh, it is a third person action adventure game where you take on the role of our main protagonist, Bryn, uh, who's basically a point for this Weaver band. So her and her companions, her Weaver band, they're basically trying uh, to find their way back into the enclave the space that's been kind of behind a magical dome for several decades and no one's been able to enter it. Um, and this used to be their own land. So they're trying to get back in to see what happened. So that's kind of the narrative arc that kind of takes you through the game. But uh, it is a game about uh, action for sure. Um, we do a lot of stuff with combining magic powers. Uh, you know, one of our taglines is the world is your weapon. We really want to set up an environment and a rule set where a player can go, well, if I can manipulate temperature and make this hot or make this cold, or I can use this kind of kinetic power to push things or pull things around, can I do this if I combine those? And it's like, yes, yes, you can. So we want to really give a lot of utility to the player to kind of come up with creative solutions to however they want, whether it's solving a navigational puzzle or taking down a big, you know, 25 meter creature. Um, this is this is really where the, the our unique hook uh, is to the game. And let's talk about those giant creatures, right? Like that's what stood out when I saw the trailers. Like, oh, that is a boss, right? Like sometimes it's like, oh, it's just a lot of health. Where do you get the inspiration to say, you know what, we're not just going to do a normal boss with a big health pool. We're going to make the boss 25 meters tall, let you do whatever you want to. Where do you even come up with an idea to say, we're just going to make this big giant roaming around and you as this tiny little person have to find a way to take him down? Yeah, I think uh, for us, for sure, we have a lot of experience on the team building third person games. And we wanted to... I mean, there's no doubt that, we, again, because we're all big consumers of games, like we have lots of our favorites, uh, yeah. you know, our love letters from the past of growing up, games that aspire us to be developers today. Um, and I can go on and on about all of those games. Um, but for us, we knew we wanted to do something with climbing. We wanted to do something with combining materials um, and playing with the physicality and the thermodynamics of what's going on. You know, a lot of games where, you know, maybe when you go to climb, it's like, oh, you have to jump on this strip of yellow and then you can jump to the next strip of yellow. And it's like, no, in our game, if it looks like something, you can climb it. Um, so you, you know, you, you work with your stamina and other creative ways to reach high places. Um, so we let the player kind of freely explore the space. Um, the same thing goes with the magic powers. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure in more like traditional kind of classic games, it's like, hey, I cast a fireball and that fireball hits something and it has X fire resistance. And that's that's the role of the dice and that's it. But we're not just doing that. It's actually, no, we're, we're emitting heat into a space 
that's making the pockets of air around you hotter. The materials that touch that pocket of air, be it wood, be it metal, they all have different reactions, combustion points. And this propagates and simulates around the player constantly. So then you throw in big creatures that have fire powers and ice powers, and then you have them interacting with the simulation and you're using Brynn to counter that or leverage it to her advantage. Um, so this is, uh, this is where it kind of started started from and the idea of just fighting big creatures is just cool to be the little one taking on this big thing and it's just fun to move on something so dynamic and play with those spells so you know creatures trying to punch you you can freeze its arm like into a cliff side and then it's trying to like break free and then there's so much things that are going on that's dynamic so every encounter is different than the last one is what we're realizing and seeing players try things that we haven't even thought about when we were building it is also really exciting for us so we're really can't wait for this game to get out to the broader audience and see what they come up with it was it was cool we got hands-on with the gamescon demo which i honestly wish more devs would help us with uh it was nice <laughs> to get but this way it gives us a better understanding of what you're actually making right what you're building so we were in there i defeated one of the bosses froze his foot right in place and then as he's shooting fire down me uh, at me, I grab the fire and toss it right back at him, right? It's the dynamic of, I felt like every boss, or at least this particular boss, I could approach it in my own method to find out mm. what worked and what didn't. I did die, but not the second time. I came back yeah. and I got him, right? So it's just, a, it's a learning thing. How much does that play into when you're designing these bosses? And how many bosses are we going to get, Jeff? Uh, you're going to get nine. Oh, good, nine cool. bosses. Uh, we call them epics. There, there's multiple factions that they come from. The one that you fought, which was the Ark of the Living Flame in our Gamescom demo, hmm. um, that was one of the uh, the arcs. Um, so biped creature that conjures you know, magic and little fire minions, as you mentioned. Um, and of course, we play with other different elements as well. And and uh, yeah, I mean, part of it is. Um, you know, that's we want the players to creatively take down the creature however they think is the right way to do it. Sometimes the right way is not the most efficient way, and that's fine. <laughs> Some players just want to be creative, and we love seeing that. Uh, and we wanted to make sure we built a rule set that allowed that. So, um, and we're in, you know, rewards you for being like that. So, one thing that's really exciting about the creatures, and again, because we're manipulating uh, materials based on temperature and stuff, we actually transcend that to the loot table. Um, so a lot of people are used to like, oh, if I break this piece, it's going to drop this piece of loot guaranteed from, from, a, from a loot table. But no, if you burn the fur, it's going to change the loot table because you burn the fur. So if you make, you know, if you make metal more brittle, it's going to change the loot table slightly. So even how you start to master your abilities, uh, this is actually going to impact uh, the loot that can happen. That's... I didn't even think about that because I took down the boss once and now I'm like, wait, I got to go do it again in a different way. I like that sort of unique style. And you talked a little bit about the climbing, which that's what stood out to me in the demo, right? Like I walked up to a tree and I was just climbing. And I was like, I'm not used to this, right? As you said, games usually like you can't climb this or you can climb this. And what really got me thinking, is there any point when you're kind of designing this kind of climb anywhere where you're like, what if a player gets up here? Should we put a kill zone? Should we put a stop? Or is it going to be like, you got your way over there, get yourself back out of that situation? Yeah, so um, Eternal Strands is not an open world game. So it's not like you can just walk multiple tens and dozens of kilometers to, you know, to the to the very end. Mm -hmm. um, it was that built those types of games before requires a very different type of budget and amount of resources to make that happen. <laughs> uh, and we were like, you know what, we're building our first game. So let's try to do it. You know, we always say here, at yellow brick games is like brick by brick. We're going to get there. So this is, this is the first brick we're laying down with eternal strands and we want to earn that S in games one day. So uh, we got to start somewhere. So, um, <laughs> the so the world the spaces in eternal strands what we would call more like open zone or more of like a hub and spoke approach um quick t like touchstones would be like a monster hunter game not wilds of course because we're going somewhere different <laughs> with that game uh but more of the every other monster hunter game up till now uh you know you have your kind of hub your base camp and then you have you know other areas that kind of connect um and those spaces sometimes connect directly to each other, and they're linked. Sometimes you know you 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 teleport uh, to those spaces. Um, we've released assets of you know Bryn walking through the Loom Gate, uh, so you see how the fast travel works as you unlock these areas. Um, so uh, so yeah, so by doing more kind of contained spaces, and these spaces are still pretty big because we want these epic creatures to freely roam in these spaces as much as possible, because that's also part of the fun and exciting thing. You may fight 
the Ark of the Living Flame, maybe in the Gamescom demo, you fought it in the garden area versus fighting it uh, actually in the atrium. It, it's, a, it's an actual different experience. So um, we wanted these spaces to be big enough for that. Um, and then in terms of like containing the player, yes, there is a certain point where you can get to like the edge. And we kind of have this lore component called the scry table where Oria, who's your mentor, can kind of pull you back to safety. And she kind of says, oh, you're going too far. I can't follow you anymore. Come back. So we kind of have an out of out of bounds area at some point that we want to say, okay, don't go any further than that. Kind of stay here. <laughs> Let's talk about the base, your home base, because after I went out and I gathered up some resources, I came back, I started upgrading my gear too, which I'm always down for. Like you say, yeah. I, I burnt the tree. I got nothing from burning the tree at all. It was just all gone. I had to go hit some boxes instead to get my loot. Went back. There's enough characters at the home base. What do they all specialize in and what's the main goal of creating these characters? Uh, so, yeah, your companions and your relationships with them, as you know, they're also an extension of your utility uh as you go through and explore um the enclave uh in the world of eternal strands um they vary they each have their own thing so we have like our lore master which is lane we have our quarter master which is kazman you know we have our smithy sola dom who's kind of weaving the magical threads into your mantle which is helping you unlock you know unlock and expose your powers um so yeah and then Oria, who's kind of your mentor um, so each of them kind of provide different functionality from maybe expanding on how many potions, health potions you have or resistant potions, or, you know, in terms of taking care of your equipment and storing your gear. So when you want to load out with different armor, you go visit Kazman. Um, and then Solo, of course, is your crafter. So, you know, you're taking all those hard earned uh, materials that you've found and discovered and earned, and you're going back to Solo and along with any blueprints. Uh, recipes of equipment, be it weapons or, or armor that you find that are kind of sprinkled and hidden throughout all the various different maps. You bring those back to Sola and then you start crafting, crafting your gear. Um, and crafting is a huge thing for us. We're big fans of crafting. Um, so you have multiple pieces of gear you can, as you guys probably experienced playing the yeah. build, that mm -hmm. you can, you know, gauntlets, leggings, torso piece, you know, helmets. Um, you can mix and match these sets as you like. Um, but one of the things we're really excited about and trying to do a little bit differently than saying, hey, there's this set recipe. You need these exact pieces to build this thing. Uh, we went back into our world logic, which is really centered around and orbits around material types, you know, wood, you know, uh, metals, like different things like that. So now as you kind of gather those materials, you could put a higher quality metal into a shield and that will give you actually a higher quality stat of that look um, as well as change the color of what that shield or weapon or piece of armor looks like so what you see and gather is actually what is crushed into your weapon so if you pick up some gold metallic looking uh material uh and then you apply that gold metal material into a shield you're going to have for that where that slot is for that material you're going to see that gold reflected on that part of the weapon or armor cool i saw that too i noticed that when i was upgrading my stuff i'm like that just changed a whole different color too oh this is i'm like i'm so yeah. in for this right i had an absolute blast playing the gamescom demo what was the reaction over there uh so Everything I heard and watched, I was not actually physically on the floor at Gamescom uh, this year. We had to kind of divide and conquer. Um, so <laughs> I couldn't make that show. I'm going to a, a future show we're going to be announcing soon. Um, oh, that was close. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, but yeah, everything that I heard from there, who who was there, Nat, Tom, Josiane, and Fred, yeah. uh, it seemed like the reaction was super positive. Again, we were not in a um, a B two C like uh, direct to consumer area. We were yeah. in a B two B to business area, just really focused on you know media, press, influencers um, could come by and take a look. It was the first time we've ever done something like that outside of you know doing friends and family and internal play tests in the studio, which we've been doing for quite some time. Um, and uh, seeing now some of those videos go live and those reactions, it's 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 amazing. You know, you work on something so long and you're yeah. like, I don't know what people are going to think. Maybe nobody will show up. Maybe they'll like it. We don't know. But we're already seeing people do fan art for characters in our game, wow, nice. which is like they don't even know this character. Like we haven't even talked like the characters in the lineup. We say one like one line about the character, but they don't know the backstory of these characters. And they're already doing fan art. So for us, it's like, wow, uh, we're really, really excited about that. 
Um, so, so far it's been amazing. Um, and, uh, yeah, I want to hear what you guys think too, since you guys got to play the build, it's not like, you know, everyone in the world gets to play the Gamescom demo. <laughs> Very true. Michael, I'll let you go first. You know, I thought, I thought the, the demo was a ton of fun and, and really the thing that stuck out to me, Jeff, and I really wanted to ask you is anytime there's like this action fantasy RPG, right? It's always about player power, right? Like the first thing I do when I fire one up, where's my skill tree? What do I want to spec into? It, this game, it seems like it's more about upgrading your mantle. When you kill an arc, you get to upgrade your mantle. Tell me a little bit more about how that works. How does my player power work? Because that's what hooks me in. And this game with its unique twist kind of has me interested how I can go about that. Yeah. So you basically have three ways of pushing your character progression. So one, we'll start with the big one, which is your powers, your magical powers that you can kind of mix. And, you, you know, you pull up your magical will. And, you know, that's our, our nine powers. Uh, as I think someone, I heard someone say, oh, it's like Mega Man. And I was like, I never thought of that. <laughs> I'm like, You're right. It is like Mega Man. Uh, so, you know, you gain these powers, you earn these powers by defeating the epic creature that it's, it's related to. Um, and of course, thematically, it's related. You see that epic creature doing a power similar to that. So it makes sense. Um, you acquire these powers by extracting uh, what we call these magical uh, threads or strands from the actual creature itself. It's called harvesting. Um, so you, every creature, you can kind of defeat every creature in two different ways. One way is you just figure out how to wound it, chip away its health bar, find its weak spots, you know, however you want to do that. Burn it, freeze it, break it, whatever. Um, and then, you know, you'll gain loot from that and, 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 you know, you'll defeat the creature. And when you defeat the creature the first time, you do unlock its power. So we give that to you right away because we realized we actually didn't originally have it designed like that. And we realized, no, 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 we want these powers in the hands of the players immediately because we see the, how much fun they're having with it. So kill the creature anyway, you're getting the power the first time. But after that, you can upgrade all these powers two more times. And in order to do that, you need to harvest the magical threads from the creature. And each one is a puzzle. Um, so you guys fought the Ark of the Living Flame. I'm not sure if you figured out how to harvest it. Um, if you didn't, uh, maybe after this call, you can go take another look. I'll give you <laughs> one clue. Um, naturally, when you play the game, we, we Lane will give you a clue. Just like a little hint, like, hey, try maybe something like this. Pay attention to. You kill it again. You don't harvest it then they give you another clue and it eventually fills out your codex to really help you figure out how to harvest it. Um, if you want to do it naturally rather than just looking it up online. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the uh, Ark of the Living Flame has several key kind of red stones located on it. Uh, you need to break those stones and then you will, you will see a harvest node open up on the creature. Then you need to climb to that harvest node, which is always fun because we want to mm -hmm. re-encourage people climbing on these beasts when they're swinging around and doing things. Uh, and then you pull these magical threads out of the creature. In instantly when you harvest, even if the creature's at full health, it's defeated. So it's an instant kill. You get the threads. You go back to your base camp. You talk to Dom, who's the weaver, for taking those magical threads and then weaving them back into your, your mantle. And now your power has been upgraded. Um, so that's, that's one huge... Mm -hmm huge piece of progression for the player because upgrading your powers gives you more versatility um then of course you have uh just by generally by helping your companions upgrade their stations this will also feed into your progression as well because now you'll be able to equip more things uh gather more things um you know you can increase your safety pouch uh so it's, should you fall in battle and be knocked out um you know, instead of being, you know, let's say you gathered, I don't know, 10 resources, maybe you can only bring back to base camp because you were knocked out only like five of those resources. But if you upgrade some of your stations, now you can bring back eight or 12 or 16. So there's there's that bit of progression. And then, of course, the big meat and potatoes uh, is definitely the armor and the weapons. Uh, so again, uh, these recipes are hidden all throughout the world in every map. Um, there are magical weapons to find. Uh, there's many different equipment sets to find as well. Uh, and uh, by gathering these and then finding the resources that you want to put into them, maybe you're more driven by stats and you're a min-maxer. Maybe you're driven by fashion and you're like, no, I just want to look like that, which That's I... Me. I totally get that. That's so me. we support both. Um, and uh, so, yeah, then there's the, all the progression there for that because you're dealing with weight has an impact on your move, movability. How much you, how fast you climb, how how far you jump, all of this, because everything about Bryn 
and our just our character in general is physics driven. So when you know you used to playing a game, you, you know you push on the stick and your character just moves forward. It's a set animation. Actually, when you push on the stick for Bryn, we look at what her foot is pushing against, how much force against the ground, and that's driving her animation forward. So. Sometimes it can lead to very chaotic things, but we've been doing this for so long. And in some ways, we kind of embrace the chaos uh, when it does happen. But we really wanted everything to be physics driven because if a big creature, you're holding on to a big creature, that that momentum of you trying to hold on, the strain of trying to hold on to it, uh, we wanted the player to feel that in the pad. Very cool. When I was playing, I found the, the world was very pleasing to the eye. Very... Uh... It was cool. I liked the art style. Art style is a big thing for me. Always pulls me in, or it doesn't, right? Eternal Strands definitely pulled me in, which caught my eye to start with. And then it was the, the big magical epics. I was like, holy, what else we got here? <laughs> and then as I'm playing, going out and I'm searching, I finished. The worst part about the demo was when it came up and said, thanks for playing the demo. And I was done. I was like, <laughs> okay, really? Like, I, I felt like I was just getting going. And yeah. the more I want to go back. And then yeah. you talked about 2025. Yep. Yeah, so early 2025. It's really right around the corner. It's I know it's <laughs> September right now, but uh, it's not that far away, um, and uh, we're feeling great about it. Uh, Is that a full know. release, or are you looking at oh, early? A? No, no, full release, full release. Full release. No, no, no. no. We're, we're everything's going out there. We've been. I'm already on my like seventh seventh playthrough of the game right now. Like we've been tuning the game, ironing out as many of the wrinkles that we can, and again doing the best we can with the size of the team that we are. Sure. Um, but uh, you know, trying to work efficiently, is make the smart choices. I, you know, there's a lot of we have a lot of great ideas and feedback we're getting from press, from you know influencers, from our own friends and family, on top of ourselves playing it. Um, and it's like, great, okay, let's pick the top ones and let, let's just nail those. And then, of course, we're going to do updates and, and patches and stuff like that after release. So we're just trying to thread the needle as best as we can. Um, but uh, it's it's coming together. I mean, the game is there. It's it's um, It ended up being longer than I think we thought it was going to be. Uh, you know, it, I, my, my playthroughs average, depending on what type of playthrough I'm trying to do, between like 25 to 35 hours is my Ooh, playthrough. Okay. So the game came out a little bit bigger, um, and that was even <laughs> as we were going through development, going, man, we can't ship all of this, so we got to cut this this biome of the game out. And I was like, man, man, we just made the game really small, but still, no, it ended up still being a good chunk of uh, adventuring to do. Um, so there's definitely going to be quite a bit there for players. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you can go back to these areas, you can fight these epics, um, and it's different. Like uh, sometimes you go at night. Sometimes you go during the day. Sometimes you go during a flash freeze. Sometimes it's a drought. Sometimes it's a clear day. Uh, we, you know, we decided to play with weather um, just because we had the simulation going on through the whole environment. And we we're like, well, what if we just made it hotter? Now Bryn's powers are, if their ice powers are a little bit weaker, but oh no, if she adds more heat, now heat's going to propagate a little bit more versus the ice is going to melt quicker. So um, yeah, we've been experimenting with that and having a lot of fun. That's man, it's it's fantastic. It's very cool to see too. Just around the corner, I'm a, I was like, it's only been in development for four years. Yeah, that's shocking because everything these days is at least six. So yeah, I mean, they're, they're, yeah, 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 yeah. Especially when you're talking like PC console, you yeah, know, very long the dev cycles. Uh, I've been there. I've I've had I've worked on games for six, seven, seven year release cycles. Um, but you know, uh, it it varies. Um, but yeah, we were able to get it uh, get it done. Uh, that's going to be probably by the time we ship it. I guess that would be about four and a half years. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, it's come a long way, and it's it's kind of wild thinking about it now. I think we're also focused just trying to make sure we sh just nail this as best as we can um you know especially when you see the state of the industry it's like we got this shot we got to make it count like uh, so let's go for it um and i think we had a moment to really just take a breath and go wow we started off we were eight yeah. and like with a dream and but but i go back and i look at our first milestone build um, we do basically build every two months uh, for or milestone deliveries every two months, we do them built every day. But um, <laughs> and I go back and I see uh, to Michael's point, like the climbing, the climbing was there. If I showed you the build back in 2020 before Christmas, you would have saw climbing. Um, and it's like we really we knew we, we wanted to tackle these things. We didn't see the market doing that. We saw everyone doing like, let's go free to play. Let's put a season pass. Let's put a battle pass. Let's do. And we're like, no, we're just going to build a game that you're just going to pay. 
and uh, you get everything. Like there's not, uh, oh, I need to buy like this and that. No, no, no. We just, you know, and we're, I think, I, I hope, I know we're not talking about our price or anything now, but, you know, <laughs> we're definitely being very cost conscious with what we're going to price this game at. Um, and, uh, you know, for sure I can tell you will not be like a premium, premium triple A cause we don't consider our game to be triple A while we have tons of triple A experience on team. We look at our game kind of in that, you know, we're an independent company. It's like indie to double A kind of space. Um, but at the end of the day, I think when players play it, they'll tell us what they think of the quality of it. Um, but hopefully we, uh, we meet their expectation. Jeff, thank you so much. Michael, you got any more questions before we let Jeff go? Otherwise, we'll take them for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess the only question I have selfishly, Jeff, I don't know if you've been allowed to tell me, this. the demo got me hyped. When's like the next update that we can expect in the media, right? When's the next trailer? Do you have any sort yeah. of timeline? That's just like, when can I learn more about this game? Because like Drew said, when they said your demo's over, I was like, no, 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 don't take this from me. So yeah. do you have any leaks you can give us on when the next <laughs> update will be? You asked me this when Nat's not here, which is <laughs> uh, what I will tell you is absolutely there are some some pretty cool announcements happening throughout the rest of the calendar year. But you're absolutely going to hear something from us before Halloween. So, yes. uh, so there, yes. there, there, there's like an eight week window. So just <laughs> hold on. There's some cool stuff coming. Oh. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know, follow follow us our socials, you know, and all of that. So we tend to put some content up. There's actually quite a bit of content out there if you go digging through everything. I mean, we covered quite a bit in the IGN first back in April. Look at what we did at Gamescom. You get to see all the experience of you, know, you guys playing the build other people playing the build then then comparing what they're doing and going what's go wait you could do that you can pick up a fireball and throw it as a projectile why not it's an entity in the game why not let players do that um you know you can also throw it into a, a kinetic stream and that's that will whip it and redirect it like there's so much stuff you can do in the game um and that that's definitely going to be the fun of people kind of going oh you can do that. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So we're trying to make sure anytime a player thinks of something they can do, we're going to hope that they can do it. Like the, the way we built the world and the systemic approach we had to the world logic. So hold on. More news coming. Excellent. Jeff, you, thank you so much for your time, man. Really appreciate it. Everybody, check out Eternal Strands. Don't miss this one. Yeah, wishlist us. It's the best thing you can do. We need it. Every wishlist counts. <laughs> Cheers, guys.